When the Emperor Arcadius was at the point of death in Byzantium, having a male child, Theodosius, who was still unweaned, he felt grave fears, not only for him, but for the government as well. Not knowing how he should provide wisely for both. For he perceived that if he provided a partner in government for Theodosius, he would in fact be destroying his own son by bringing forward against him a foe clothed in the regal power. While if he set him alone over the empire, many would try to mount the throne, taking advantage, as they might be expected to do, of the helplessness of the child. These men would rise against the government and, after destroying Theodosius, would make themselves tyrants without difficulty. Since the boy had no kinsman in Byzantium to be his guardian. For Arcadius had no hope that the boy's uncle, Honorius, would secure him, inasmuch as the situation in Italy was already troublesome and he was equally disturbed by the attitude of the Medes, fearing lest these barbarians should trample down the youthful emperor and do the Romans irreparable harm. When Arcadius was confronted with this difficult situation, though he had not shown himself sagacious in other matters, he devised a plan which was destined to preserve without trouble both his child and his throne. Either as a result of conversation with certain of the learned men, such as are usually found in numbers among the advisers of a sovereign, or from some divine inspiration which came to him. For in drawing up the writings of his will, he designated the child as his successor to the throne. But appointed as guardian over him is Degerdes, the Persian king, enjoining upon him earnestly in his will to preserve the empire for Theodosius by all his power and foresight. So Arcadius died, having thus arranged his private affairs as well as those of the empire. But Isdegerdes, the Persian king, when he saw this writing which was duly delivered to him, being even before a sovereign whose nobility of character had won for him the greatest renown, did then display a virtue at once amazing and remarkable. For, loyally observing the behests of Arcadius, he adopted and continued without interruption a policy of profound peace with the Romans, and thus preserved the empire for Theodosius. Indeed, he straightway dispatched a letter to the Roman Senate, not declining the office of guardian of the Emperor Theodosius, and threatening war against any who should attempt to enter into a conspiracy against him. When Theodosius had grown to manhood and was in the prime of his life, and Istigerdes had been taken from the world by disease, Vararanes, the Persian king, invaded the Roman domains with a mighty army. However, he did no damage, but returned to his home without accomplishing anything. This came about in the following way. Anatolius, general of the East, had, as it happened, been sent by the Emperor Theodosius as ambassador to the Persians, alone and unaccompanied. As he approached the Median army, solitary as he was, he leapt down from his horse and advanced on foot towards Varinares. And when Varinares saw him, he inquired from those who were near who this man could be who was coming forward. And they replied that he was the general of the Romans. Thereupon, the king was so dumbfounded by this excessive degree of respect that he himself wheeled his horse about and rode away. And the whole Persian host followed him. When he had reached his own territory, he received the envoy with great cordiality and granted the treaty of peace on the terms which Anatolius desired of him. 
One condition, however, he added, that neither party should construct any new fortification in his own territory, in the neighbourhood of the boundary line between the two countries. When this treaty had been executed, both sovereigns then continued to administer the affairs of their respective countries, as seemed best to them.